a Wikividi Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. School Shooting A school shooting is an attack at an educational institution, such as a school or university, involving the use of a firearm. Incidents that involve four or more deaths are also categorized as mass shootings. School shootings have sparked a political debate over gun violence, zero-tolerance policies, and gun control. The United States has the highest number of school-related shootings. Younger Age, Rain 2002, Steinberg 2002, Deacon, Overman, 2004, Figner et al. 2009, Burnett et al. 2010. According to Rain, immaturity is one of many identified factors increasing the likelihood of an individual committing criminal acts of violence and outbursts of aggression. This fact is supported by findings on brain development occurring as individuals age from birth. According to the Australian-based Raising Children Network and Centre for Adolescent Health, the main change occurring in the developing brain during adolescence is the pruning of unused connections in thinking and processing, while this is occurring within the brain. Retained connections are strengthened. Synaptic pruning occurs because the nervous system in humans develops by firstly, the overproducing of parts of the nervous system, axons, neurons, and synapses, to then later in the development of the nervous system. Make redundant the superfluous parts, i.e. pruning. These changes occur in certain parts of the brain firstly. The prefrontal cortex, the brain location where decision-making occurs, is the concluding area for development. While the prefrontal cortex is developing, children and teenagers might possibly rely more on the brain part known as the amygdala, involving thinking that is more emotionally active, including aggression and impulsiveness. As a consequence each individual is more likely to want to make riskier choices. Steinberg identified the fact of adolescents taking more risks typically, than adults, Deacon et al. and Ovman et al. indicate a decline in risk-taking from adolescence to adulthood, Steinberg, Figner et al and Burnett et al. identified adolescent age individuals as more likely to take risks than young children and adults. Gun ownership Evidence shows the number of deaths by guns in any population correlates to the number of guns owned within the same population. However, some countries with high numbers of gun owners also have very low gun-related deaths, such as Iceland. Profiling the United States Secret Service published a study regarding 37 school shooting incidents in the United States from 1974 through June 2000, which warned against the belief that a certain type of student would be a perpetrator. According to the study, any profile could apply to any student and might not apply to a potential perpetrator. Some perpetrators were children of divorce, or lived in foster homes, or came from intact families. A few were loners, but most had close friends. Some experts such as Alan Lippmann have warned against the dearth of empirical validity of profiling methods. While it may be simplistic to assume a straightforward profile, the study did find certain similarities among the perpetrators. The researchers found that killers do not snap. They plan. They acquire weapons. These children take a long, considered, public path toward violence. Oftentimes, shooters are inspired by past shootings as motivation for the method of executing these attacks, from the guns to purchase down to the what to wear during the attack. Princeton's Catherine Newman has found that, far from being loners, the perpetrators are joiners, whose attempts at social integration fail, and that they let their thinking and even their plans be known, sometimes frequently over long periods of time. In addition, Psychologist Peter Langman has noted that school shooters typically fall into one of three categories, psychopathic, psychotic, or traumatized, an angle that it not mentioned in media, but is bolstered by important social scientists' as dysfunctional family structure. Eminent Harvard sociologist Robert J. Sampson wrote, Family structure is one of the strongest, if not the strongest, predictor of variations in urban violence across cities in the United States. His views are echoed by the eminent criminologists Michael Gottfriedson and Travis Hirschi, who have written that such family measures as the percentage of the population divorced, the percentage of households headed by women, 
and the percentage of unattached individuals in the community are among the most powerful predictors of crime rates. According to Dr. Peter Langman, it is a myth that school shooters come from stable homes, and showed that in one sample, 82% of the shooters were from dysfunctional families, while 18% from intact families. Perpetrators who run amok in schools and other public settings do also share in common a severe lapse or more pervasive deficit in their capacity for empathy coupled with their inability to contain their aggression. This may be due to their psychopathy, psychotic symptoms, and or to a consequence of significant violent traumatization, such as that of early physical abuse, that contributes to the development of dissociative states of mind. In short, as clinical psychiatrist Daniel Schechter has written, for a baby to develop into a troubled adolescent who then turns lethally violent, a convergence of multiple interacting factors must occur. That is, every bit as complicated dot as it is for a tornado to form on a beautiful spring day in Kansas. Many of the shooters told Secret Service investigators that alienation or persecution drove them to violence. According to the United States Secret Service, one trait that has not yet attracted as much attention is the gender difference. Nearly all school shootings are perpetrated by young males, and in some instances the violence has clearly been gender-specific. Bob Herbert addressed this in an October 2006 New York Times editorial. However, at least three female school shooting incidents have been documented, including Laurie Dan of Winnetka, Illinois, though the perpetrators of school shootings are often said to be almost exclusively white males. This is misleading. A study of 48 shooters found that though white males constituted 79% of secondary school shooters, white males were actually a minority among college and other adult perpetrators. There is significant racial, ethnic, and gender diversity among school shooters. These shootings have happened in suburban and rural school districts, and many seem to be random, with random targets. Most of these shooters tend to come from two-parent households and have been found to appear on the honor roll at their schools. School shootings receive extensive media coverage and are frequent in the U.S. They had sometimes resulted in nationwide changes of schools' policies concerning discipline and security. Some experts have described fears about school shootings as a type of moral panic. Such incidents may also lead to nationwide discussion on gun laws. School bullying Bullying is common in schools and seem to play a role in the lives of many of the school shooters. A typical bullying interaction consists of three parts. The offender slash bully, a victim and one or more bystanders. This formula of three enables the bully to easily create public humiliation for their victim. Students who are bullied tend to develop behavioral problems, depression, less self-control and poorer social skills, and to do worse in school. Once humiliated, Victims never want to be a victim again and try to regain their image by joining groups. Often, they are rejected by their peers and follow through by restoring justice in what they see as an unjust situation. Their plan for restoration many times results in violence as shown by the school shooters. 75% of school shooters claimed or left behind evidence of them being victims of bullying, including Nathan Ferris, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, Edmara Parasido Freitas, Brian Head, Sung Huicho, Wellington Menezes Oliveira, Jeff Weezer, Adam Lanza, and Nicholas Cruz. Cyberbullying has changed the effect of bullying in another way. In the modern era a bully can also do so on Facebook and Twitter for the world to see. Once something is on the internet, it cannot truly be removed further enhancing the torment. That type of bullying is infinitely easier for the perpetrator to commit and just as infinitely hard for the victim to address or escape. Notoriety Shooting massacres in English-speaking countries often occur close together in time. Forensic psychiatrists attribute this to copycat behavior, which can be correlated with the level of media exposure. In these copycat shootings, oftentimes the perpetrators see a past school shooter as an idol so they want to carry out an even more destructive, murderous shooting in hopes of gaining recognition or respect. Some mass murderers study media reports of previous killers. Research has now shown the presence of a direct correlation between a desire for infamy and school shootings. This hypothesis was suggested by Justin Nutt in 2013. Those who feel as though they are alone and who feel no one will remember them may seek to be remembered through acts of violence. 
Nutt explains through the examination of the way in which news exposure is connected not to the victims, but the perpetrators, in an age of internet news and 24-hour news cycle, to avoid doing so would be seen as poor news reporting, but it also means those who feel nameless and as though no one will care or remember them, when they are gone may feel doing something such as a school shooting will make sure they are remembered and listed in the history books. This has been linked as a leading cause of most school shootings and planned, but unexecuted school shooting. Recent premeditative writings were presented according to court documents and show Joshua O'Connor wrote that he wanted the death count to be as high as possible so that the shooting would be infamous. Infamy and notoriety, a desire to be remembered, has been reported as the leading reason for planned shootings by most perpetrators who were taken alive either pre- or post-shooting. Injustice Collectors in a 2015 New Republic essay, Columbine author Dave Cullen described a subset of school shooters known as, Injustice Collectors. The essay described and expanded on the work of retired FBI profiler Mary Ellen O'Toole, who has published a peer-reviewed journal article on the subject. It also quoted Gary Nesner, who helped create and lead the FBI's hostage negotiation unit, and served as chief negotiator for 10 years. Mental Illness the degree to which mental illness does or does not contribute to school shootings has been debated in society. Although the vast majority of mentally ill individuals are non-violent, some evidence has suggested that mental illness or mental health symptoms are nearly universal among school shooters. For example, on April 16, 2007, a Virginia Tech student named Sung Hui Cho shot and killed 32 faculty members and students on the campus and injured 25 more before taking his own life. For another instance, a 2002 report by the U.S. Secret Service and U.S. Department of Education found evidence that a majority of school shooters displayed evidence of mental health symptoms, often undiagnosed or untreated criminologists Fox and Delatter note that mental illness is only part of the issue, however, and mass shooters tend to externalize their problems, blaming others and are unlikely to seek psychiatric help, even if available. Other scholars have concluded that mass murderers display a common constellation of chronic mental health symptoms, chronic anger, or antisocial traits, and a tendency to blame others for problems. However, they note that attempting to profile school shooters with such a constellation of traits will likely result in many false positives as many individuals with such a profile do not engage in violent behaviors. McGinty and colleagues conducted a study to find out if people tended to associate the violence of school shootings with mental illness, at the expense of other factors such as the availability of high-capacity magazines. Nearly 2,000 participants read a news piece on a shooting in which the shooter is diagnosed as having a mental illness and who used high-capacity magazines. One group read an article that presented only the facts of the case. A different group read an article about the same shooting, but in it the author advocated for gun restrictions for people with mental illness. Another group read about the shooting in an article that suggested the proposal to ban large-capacity magazines, which acted to advocate that shootings could stem from a societal problem rather than an individual problem. The control group did not read anything. Participants were then all asked to fill out a questionnaire asking about their views on gun control, and whether they thought there should be restrictions on high-capacity magazines. 71% of the control group thought that gun restrictions should be applied to people with mental illness, and nearly 80% of participants who read the articles agreed. Despite the fact that the article exposed the readers to both the mental illness of the shooter and the fact that the shooter used high-capacity magazines, participants advocated more for gun restrictions on people with mental illness rather than bans on high-capacity magazines. This suggests that people believe mental illness is the culprit for school shootings in lieu of the accessibility of guns or other environmental factors. The authors expressed concern that proposals to target gun control laws at people with mental illness do not take into account the complex nature of the relationship between serious mental illness and violence, much of which is due to additional factors such as substance abuse. However, the link is unclear, since research has shown that violence in mentally ill people occur more in interpersonal environments. Brought to you by Wikivideo Documentaries would you like to know more?